So tonight we are, again, we're Joliet's Greatest Mystery, Molly Zelko, and I'm going to now share my screen. I'm going to get us to our presentation. So here we go. I hope everyone can see that. And there we are. Okay, everyone see the screen okay? I hope so. I'm going to go to presenter view. It's a little nicer for me. Um, I think I can still check the chat here, right? I'll know if it blows up if we have an echo. If I see like 16 notifications, I'll, I'll assume we have an echo. So, um, okay. Uh, so I do, you know, I mentioned that we were tying these um, programs, presentations to museums, museum projects. Um, and one of those we've done recently, actually, we, we maybe timed it a little <laughs> poorly. We really couldn't plan it with, uh, with COVID striking. Um, we released this in January um, after about two or three years of production, very meticulous production. Um, you know, certainly with the true crime genre um, elevating a lot of cold cases, the hope was that um, communicating this story via podcast um, would hopefully help a lead or a break or something to try to get some closure um, for this really important, really incredible case, this amazing story um, that certainly when I came to Joliet, I, I did not know about it. And I heard people kind of whispering about, well, you should look at Molly Zelko, you should do something with Molly Zelko. And um, it was one of those stories that, and I'm sure our panelists are going to attest that, you're just amazed you didn't know. Um, you're amazed with all the players involved, with the national vacations involved in this very fascinating era of the late 1950s and um, the mafia emerging nationwide, J. Edgar Hoover, Bobby Kennedy, all of these worlds just, it's like a novel, um, but it's its true, it's real life and it happened right here in Juliet. So um, Maybe some of you join us have listened to the podcast. Maybe you have not. This is for everyone, um, whether, you, whether you've listened and have nerded out and gone down every rabbit hole you can, or if you're new to the story um, and you're joining us for the first time and joining the story for the first time, um, the plan is for us to make this approachable either way. So what I'm going to do as moderator is just kind of start with a, uh, a little bit of an intro, just talk about Molly Zelko's Joliet, some of the emergence of organized crime at the national level. Um, you can't talk about Molly without talking about Bill McCabe. Um, you can't talk about Molly's disappearance without talking about Francis Curry. Um, Jimmy Reaney is another name that comes up that we'll talk about. Um, and Jimmy Reaney is tied to Robert F. Kennedy, who um, amazingly came to Joliet to look for Molly um, after her disappearance. So um, again, very incredible national implications to the story. Um, and then, you know, the way, pretty much the way everyone in Joliet has come to this story um, that I've known about is in 1978. Um, and Lonnie, who's here with us tonight, uh, I'm gonna introduce him shortly, uh, you know, via the Joliet Herald News in this incredible two week series that people still talk about as though it was yesterday um, in 1978, really reintroduced the case to us. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Molly's legacy briefly, uh, take some questions. We have some questions that were previously submitted to us via social media. Uh, we appreciate those of you who did submit some questions and then we are going to, um, between the three of us, we've taken a lot of, you know, just talking about Molly over the years. What are some kind of FAQs, if you will, that I think, you know, is just kind of some of these persistent questions we get um, maybe dispelling some rumors, some conspiracy theories out there. Um, and then, you know, uh, time permitting, we'll open it up to everyone to take some questions via chat. So, um, but before we go too much farther, I do want to, uh, a couple thank yous. Uh, Joliet Public Library not only co-produced the uh, podcast with us, they are co-sponsoring this with us tonight, um, along with our friends at uh, Warmer Rogers, Duran, Razan, um, CPAs, who just a longstanding uh, Joliet CPA firm. So uh, we want to thank them for the support. Uh, Joey Lieberman, who is a colleague of mine in the music world, uh, helped co-produce the podcast, um, donated an incredible amount of his time, as did people who participated in the podcast um, and helped produce the podcast. Um, 
Jim and Arlene are two of actually uh, Molly's relatives who appeared on the podcast, um, a niece and a nephew. Um, and they were, you know, really, I think, you know, brave to share their stories. And I'm, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, it's become a meme in the community, but Molly was a real person with a real family. Um, and I think we, we had seen possibly we had some family members even joining us tonight, some descendants. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, Don, Matt, and Megan from the library. Uh, appreciate you guys. If all of you are on, I know Matt's on. Um, and, you know, Matt's going to talk a little bit, you know, as we wrap up about the continuity here, you know, Lonnie and Dennis going and looking at microfilms and old newspapers and binders of old spectators that the museum has and kind of these little bit of older school methods of research, you know, and now we're talking about the library's digital media studio um, and recording a podcast and digitizing cassette tapes and micro cassettes and um, even an old reel that Molly used, you know, <laughs> she tapped someone's phone line and we were able to even digitize that. So is that public knowledge? No, I don't know. <laughs> but, okay. Um, but, you know, just what is old is new again. So um, without further ado, uh, I have soapbox this thing enough. So I want to introduce our panelists um, joining me. Um, okay. And I'm getting some notifications here. So hopefully the feedback's gone. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so let's start with Lonnie. And uh, again, kind of the, a name very closely associated with this story. Um, he was the managing editor of the Times, a daily newspaper in Ottawa for 30 years. Um, many of you in Joliet are going to know him as having worked for the Herald News in Joliet in the 1970s. Um, he and fellow reporter John Whiteside, a uh, very legendary name in Joliet, uh, worked on many projects together and, you know, the most amazing being the one we're discussing tonight, Molly Zelko. Uh, now retired and working on a book about Molly. I think he's working on the book about Molly. Um, and we're, we're excited to have him here. Uh, Lonnie, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and I'll go over to Dennis. Um, Dennis Henrietta, lifelong resident of Carbon Hill, Coal City. Um, Coal City plays into this story, and Dennis will tell us how a little bit later. Uh, graduated from SIU Carbondale, 1973. Uh, he has one sister, Michelle Masetich, and we know her um, if you're in the history world. Um, she works with the Canal Corridor Alliance. That's how I, I know Michelle in the Carbon Hill Museum. Um, and a brother, Mark, followed grandparents, parents, footsteps operating Little Bums Tavern in Carbon Hill, Illinois, from 74 to 94. Um, then went on to work at Harris Empress Casinos in Joliet and happily retired. Um, an avid fan of mysteries. He's an independent researcher. Um, the Herald News landed on his bar, as he'll tell you. I don't want to spoil his story. Um, and has been fascinated since that moment in 1978 when the case came to so many people in Joliet. Um, and he's joining us tonight. So gentlemen, again, appreciate you being here. And um, we also want to acknowledge the museum's board chair. Um, she's not able to join us tonight. She's having some health challenges, but uh, Lynn Lichtenauer participated in the podcast. Um, she actually, at one point, was working for the Spectator um, on the Society pages. She actually sat at Molly's desk and used her typewriter at one point. And she, um, if you've listened to the podcast, you know she has some just incredible memories of Joliet, incredible memories of people involved in the case. So um, Lynn, we miss you and we know, you know, very few things would stop you from being here with us tonight. So um, we're thinking about you and rooting for you and we want you to get well soon and, and get back here soon and maybe we can even do this again. Okay, so, you know, again, a lot of how we get to Molly starts with the shoes and everyone talks about the shoes. The shoes were what was found on the sidewalk um, after the night of September 25th, 1957, when Molly disappeared. Um, we get asked about those and Lonnie will kind of build on, you know, why those are important. And there's just so much symbol, symbolism, um, just this fictional story almost. And even at the time, there was this fascination with it. And, um, you know, you can see in some of these period magazines, uh, it was just enticing to people again. It had all these ingredients of a work of fiction. Um, and again, I think I mentioned it, it has almost become a meme in the community, but, um, you know, again, you have to remember that, you know, Molly was 
a real person, a real family. Um, and I, <laughs> as I, as I pass over her picture here, um, but you know, I, I think you just have to remember that, you know, tonight we're, we're not speculating. We're not saying we think this person is business, um, you know, as, as journalists, historians, researchers, um, you know, we are kind of going back to what was reported at the time and kind of examining what people were saying when this happened. And certainly that was what Lonnie and John did in the seventies when they reopened the case. You're, you're kind of going back and looking and not to say things didn't get interesting or even a little bizarre sometimes. Um, but, uh, it's just a wild story. So, um, Let's go right into Molly Zelko's Joliet. Um, again, I don't want to, I think we're at kind of a, I've said a 200 level of people, probably, you know, a lot of you are somewhat familiar with the case. So um, who was Molly Zelko? We ask ourselves that a lot. Um, she was a, called a crusading journalist. Um, she was a fighter. She was tough. Um, she had friends, enemies in Joliet. She was polarizing. Um, but she really came about in an era when locally, nationally, um, you know, Jager Hoover famously said there's no such thing as a national syndicate of organized crime. And kind of we were, we were learning differently in the 1950s. Um, the, uh, the Appalachian Conference, which, you know, was famously busted up in New York, um, demonstrated for the first time, like, no, wait, there is some coordination between these different cities and different people. So um, this was kind of dispelling this notion of that. And um, Lonnie has a, a little tell about that. I won't take it from him, but uh, coin operated machines were big at the time in Joliet. Um, and now we kind of laugh at this notion of like, you know, pinball machines were dangerous and keep your children away from them. But there was outfit control over jukeboxes, over pinballs. Um, gambling rackets, coin operated machines were called the new booze after prohibition basically killed the mob's largest revenue stream. Um, so you diversify like any, any large corporation, right? So, um, gambling rackets, coin operated machines, jukebox, pinballs, slot machines. Um, and it got political here in Joliet and Joliet was not unique, but, um, it was, it was a hot button front and center political issue here with these pinballs and steered control of the city council. Um, and all the while that this is going on, you have a major regime change in the Chicago outfit um, with what were called, you know, the Capone era gangsters, um, the Paul Ricas, um, who we'll hear a little more about. And we're coming into what we'll call the new Capones with Sam G and Kana and this younger generation um, so going back to regime change. So um, with that, maybe now, Lonnie, I'll go over to you and you can kind of talk a little bit about the background, some of the things that Molly was fighting against, fighting for, just kind of talk about where was, was Molly in 1957? And I know we, we do have to go back in time a little bit to talk about Bill McKay, but um, can you talk a little bit about the setup with, with these bullet points, if you will, and I'll make sure I mute. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Molly uh, and McCabe, Bill McCabe, were uh, the two people that made the spectator what it was. Um, a lot of credit goes to Molly as being a crusading reporter. Um, she was actually behind the scenes a great deal. It was Bill McCabe who was uh, up front with a uh, thinking, uh, thinking it over column that he put on page three every day. And he was brutal with his criticisms. Uh, he took on politicians uh, in uh, crime, corruption. Um, then in 1948, um, he was beat up. Uh, he was driven off the road and he was beat up and left for dead. Um, and it was that incident in 1948 that incensed Molly um, because of uh, McCabe's condition at that time. He couldn't, he wasn't in the office as much. Uh, uh, his physical abilities were limited. Uh, he was still continuing to write his column, but Molly became obsessed with trying to find out who actually beat up McCabe in 1948. She did not. Uh, they never arrested anyone for that. Uh, but her obsession became 
gambling, political corruption, which is something McCabe cared about all the time. Uh, both of them uh, came together. They worked, Molly and McCabe worked in the state's attorney's office. Um, and uh, he had one term uh, at the end of his first term. Uh, he purchased the Spectator newspaper and brought Molly with him. She was helping him run his office uh, in the state's attorney's office. And he brought her he brought her into the Spectator to help him with his pursuit of what he considered to be good journalism, uh, making politicians accountable uh, and trying to uh, do what was right for the community. He was very outspoken. Molly was obsessed with gambling and her obsession with gambling was connected directly to the man that she uh, knew was in charge of it, Francis Curry. Um, so she was also basically taking on the mob. Um, she had uh, been threatened. Um, there, it was uh, not uncommon to have bricks thrown through the windows at the spectator office. Um, and there were many, many uh, occasions where she would tell friends, uh, if they get me, I'll kick off my shoes, which is, gets into the shoe story. Um, I'm not too sure how far you want me to go, Greg. Uh, with the, the explanation of where, where she was at and what she was trying to do. Uh, maybe if I can, I can kick it over to Dennis to kind of talk about the emergence of Sam Giancana, what was kind of happening with that regime change, if you will, in the mob, Dennis, and make sure you're unmuted too uh, before you talk. All said. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> yeah, basically, a lot, a lot of what Lonnie says sums it up. Uh, what was mostly important about the, the organized crime president of Joliet is they had their footprint in as early as the 30s and when McCabe was state's attorney. Um, and it wasn't until the 40s when Francis Curry through his association with Paul Rica was given the gambling uh, lead in Joliet and Will County after Liam Kelly was killed. Um, organized crime was going through uh, a big change in their rackets. They were uh, adding, like he said, the pinball machines were replacing the slots. The bookmakers were a little more independent, but the, uh, the change from the Chicago outfit from, like he said, the early Capone days and the Paul Rica and old time mafia guys like Accardo to Giancana was the important thing. Um, in Molly Joko's Joliet 57, what, what Greg was talking about is that as a crusader, Molly was making some headway by 57. She had got him, they were, they were influential in changing the city politics by getting the mayor ousted and indicted. Um, they had gotten the government in Joliet changed from a mayor to a councilman situation. Um, slot machines were undergoing a, a ban in the city, even though clubs could still have them as long as they bought a license and stamp and paid tax. Um, that was to come in uh, January of 58. It was just, they had just made the change in 57. But uh, the emergence of organized crime always played a part in Will County and it all came to a head in 57. Dennis, thank you. Um, I believe my slide is up for Bill McCabe, and that's a very dramatic photo of him taken after he was nearly beaten to death in 1948. Um, and Lonnie, you began talking about Bill McCabe. So um, can you build on Bill McCabe a little bit more and kind of his path leading up to 1948 and that fateful evening where he was found on the side of the road uh, between Lockport and Joliet, beaten nearly to death? Uh, yeah. Um, when, when McCabe was state's attorney and, and then lost uh, after uh, one term, uh, he purchased the newspaper. Uh, and he, early on in one of his uh, thinking columns uh, in those early issues when he first took over the paper, um, he, put, he, he pointed out that I'm not going, people come up to me and say, oh, now you can get your enemies. Um, but he pointed out in the column, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to be a good journalist. I'm going to be fair. I am going to stand up for what's right and what's justice. But <clears throat> if you follow through with what he did with the thinking uh, column, uh, he was pretty brutal. Uh, and he did take on, I guess, what you would call his political enemies. 
Um, and that included uh, mob controlled uh, issues, uh, the slots, uh, political corruption. Um, and in 1948, he was running uh, for office. It was, it's kind of an interesting thing to point out that uh, back in, in, in those days, uh, they didn't consider it to be unethical to be a journalist covering something, but then also uh, an office holder. Um, and he, he always loved politics, uh, although I think the media, the newspapers uh, was his first love. But he was running for a precinct committeeman post and it was an extremely um, powerful uh, precinct. Um, and he had, been, uh, he had been told to get out of the race. Um, he had, uh, it, he, I, his feeling was that after he was beat up, that's the reason that he was beat up. It was, it, was more political than anything else. There's a lot of uh, conflicting stories with that. Uh, the early newspaper stories on his beating, uh, he was saying, I don't know why, they, why this happened. Um, and uh, maybe it was robbery, although we had a really expensive watch that was not taken. The, all they took was the money in his wallet. Um, the, the, one of the first persons to go in and see him in the hospital was Molly. Uh, and she told the press afterwards that his, his comment to her was, well, it looks like they got me. Um, Molly was convinced, and, and McCabe was telling the media after this, that it was uh, Curry that uh, uh, wanted him out of the race, and that's how he did it. Um, the sad part is that McCabe was never really the same person after that, although he, he still continued to write his column, and he still was taking shots. Um, it, just, it just got harder for him to do that as time went on. This was also kind of opened the door for Molly uh, to um, have more control over the newspaper. Uh, the relationship that she had with McCabe uh, was, was very close, goes, going all the way back to the state's attorney's office. And uh, she slowly built control and ownership of the newspaper to the point where she was half owner. Uh, and then if the if if one of the other were to die, it was set up that they would become full owner of the newspaper. Um, McCabe's family was cut out of it. Um, so Molly, Molly was obsessed with finding uh, what happened to McCabe um, and, uh, and was ever, never really able to do that. Uh, although her obsession led her to put extreme, uh, a lot of pressure on uh, local gambling and she was pushing very hard uh, the month that she disappeared uh, to put pressure on closing a new gambling place that had opened in downtown Joliet. Um, and that was right before she disappeared. Hey, the name was mentioned uh, several times here, Curry, referring to Francis Curry. So I'm gonna put up my next slide here. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, why don't I kick it over to you, Dennis, to tell us a little bit about Francis Curry, um, commonly identified as a syndicate influence person, leader, depending where you read it or what was reported on him um, here in Joliet in that period. And we have a little bit of information um, about him here. He has certainly a, a Sorted history. We know he was very close with Paul Rica. He had some serious connections to the upper echelons of the Chicago outfit. So, um, can you give us a little bit of background on Francis Curry, please, Dennis? Sure, sure, Greg. Thanks. Um, the the mob uh, the mob by the '30s and '40s was faced with a managerial decision, and they decided to expand their territories as you have on your slide there. Um, one story identifies him as trying to take over in Louisville. It was reported also that not only Louisville, but New Orleans, St. Louis, Kansas City were targets. Locally, they had started the expansion by leaving Chicago and going to Elgin, Aurora and Joliet Lockport. This relationship with Rika started, I believe it's been reported that in the early 40s, he was running a poker house for him up in Harvard Heights. And when Rika bought a farm down in Kendall County, uh, being from Joliet, when Rika went to prison in 43, um, Curry was asked and, and agreed to oversee the farm and other real estate holdings. 
his relationship with Rika built more when Rika was transferred to Leavenworth and Curry was uh, charged with being one of a couple of couriers that would deliver messages personally with Paul Rika on a day before cell phones. And he would go down to the St. Louis area, the Kansas City area, meet with Paul Rika in Leavenworth as a, under an assumed name. And so Rika rewarded Curry for all his loyalty and helping him with those chores by setting him up in Joliet, first with the race wire called Transamerica in 45. And when that failed, when the Joliet government or the police broke that down, um, Liam Kelly, who ran the gambling in Joliet at the time, is slain in his driveway and miraculously Francis Curry ends up with the job. Um, his interest in the McCabe and Zelgo case is your last line there. Um, he actually, the first day when she was missing, went into the police department and asked if they wanted to talk to him. Um, he was never charged or implicated in that. But the, the relationship with Rika plays the big part because that brings the Chicago mob right into Will County and its representatives, Francis Curry. Thank you. Um, you know, to give people an idea, I you know presume there's probably a level of knowledge here about syndicate hierarchy, but uh, Al Capone was Rika's best man, if I recall, or vice versa. Right. When Rika came over uh, from the old country, he stopped in New York. He got set up in Chicago and uh, became a waiter at, at uh, for for uh, Esposito and. Capone was a patron of that restaurant and liked what he saw, offered uh, Rika a job running bourbon from Kentucky up to Wilco up to Chicago. And from then on, from then on, Rika was uh, led up the scale until he was actually the head man by the time, by the time he got to Chicago. So yeah, he was a very close uh, companion of Capone's. He oversaw Frank Nitty when Nitty took over for Capone. And then he appointed a Cardo when he went to prison. So Rika was considered the real head of the Chicago outfit. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I do think that's fascinating. It was reported at the time, Curry following Molly's disappearance, walking right into the Joliet police department. Am I a suspect? I'll talk to you. So um, I think that just, that shows kind of how well known this feud in the community, this animosity between the McCabe Molly faction and the Curry faction, how obvious that was even then. So uh, fascinating. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Lonnie, can I kick it over to you? Any, any additional information you, you want to give us about Curry, about his role in the community, what he was doing in relation to Molly, anything, anything to add there? Um, I, I would note that uh, everyone in town, when Molly disappeared, uh, were they were all whispering, oh, it's Curry, it's Curry, he got her, he got her, uh, because he, he was the man. Everybody in town knew that. He, he, was, he was the man in charge of the gambling. He was, he was mob connected. Um, I think, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, but I, I do believe that he was actually reporting to Frank Laporte, and uh, I, Laporte was calling a lot of the shots, and, uh, and he was kind of reporting to Laporte. Uh, I don't think that Curry, uh, if he were to put a hit out on Molly, I don't think he could do that uh, without permission from higher up. Um, and it, it, it's interesting to try to decide why they would do that. But she was, she was putting a, a lot of pressure um, on the gambling uh, aspect in Joliet. Um, as Dennis uh, noted earlier, uh, the spectator, uh, her and McCabe were instrumental in changing the vote swing, uh, getting uh, new, uh, new voices on the city council so that there was a, a, a majority on the council now, a one vote majority, to uh, make it illegal, make the slot machines illegal. Um, so she was, they were able to get that voice on the council, get the council to say to make them illegal, and it, and it was supposed to go into effect that January. Molly never got a chance to see it take place because she vanished in uh, 
in September. So it, it's easy to make uh, the, the assumption that the mob had something to do with the disappearance because of the type of pressure she was putting on the gambling influence. Um, but as also noted, uh, there, was, there was no arrest. Um, they uh, had a brief chat with Curry and that was about it. Thank you, Lonnie. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dennis, did oh, you want to, uh, the comment was Frank Laporte. Do you want to talk a little bit Correct. about Frank Laporte? Frank Laporte was the underboss for the s southwestern side of Chicago, including Will County. And Francis Curry had worked his way up to almost an equal, but he was still under uh, Frank Laporte in the, in the pecking order. Rika was, the, Rika was definitely the boss. Um, Francis Curry, like Lonnie said, probably wouldn't be the one to order a, a hit, but the only association here was that if something that big would have happened in Joliet, there's no doubt Curry would have known about it, maybe helped arrange it, and I use the word maybe, um, but no, other than Frank Laporte and maybe Willie Dodano, it went straight from Rika to Curry, but he would have known about it. And uh, yeah, I do want to give a shout out. Uh, there's a, a wonderful book, uh, Laporte's Territory, more of Chicago Heights area, but you know certainly, you know two two bigger cities, Joliet, Chicago Heights. And there's a really great book that we referenced, and I spoke, chatted briefly with the author, uh, The Boys in Chicago Heights, uh, the Forgotten Crew of the Chicago Outfit. Um, it's by uh, Nat Luzzi. I would recommend. It's a pretty be brief read. It's a really interesting read and kind of talks about Chicago Heights and a little bit more of, you know, Laporte's territory. Um, but right, you know, the hierarchy was there and certainly um, we'll talk a little bit more about perhaps outfit involvement in this, but yeah, I think we would all agree. Many people who have studied the mob, studied this history are gonna agree that you know, something could not just happen to a reporter without a serious level of permission, if you will. Um, and that kind of leads into um, our next slide and our next person we're gonna talk about. Um, and I don't know, I don't believe I mentioned uh, another shout out I wanna give is that uh, um, a, a reporter by the name of John Conroy who, um, in the 90s did a very extensive piece on Molly in the Chicago Reader in hopes that I think they were gonna introduce it to a little bit of a wider audience in Chicago and kind of revisit this story in the early 90s. Um, and he also ended up, um, we'll talk a little bit about our, our friend, Jimmy the Green Hornet Reney here. Um, but as a result of investigating that case, got to know Jimmy Reney, who I think in early 2000s was still alive and. Uh, provided us, if you listen to the podcast, um, these in incredible interviews where um, he sits with Jimmy Reaney for presumably, you know, at least a few hours. And Jimmy Reaney is just going on and on about his life of crime. You can still find the reader article. It's still out there um, on the internet. Um, but it, it was this incredibly strange, bizarre break in the case um, where this name came up and an even bigger name is gonna come up after Jimmy Reaney. Um, he had prior arrests for um, terrorizing rival coin operator um, entities where you know bars had non-outfit pinballs, jukeboxes. Um, he was also, um, he went to a couple newspaper offices too around this period. He had a he had a um, companion tough guy um, Alex Ross who would go these places with him. And um, fortunately, in that case, it was Harwood Heights or Norwood Heights. I think the newspaper was located. Um, the newspaper editor was not there, but this was all kind of happening during this same period of time. Um, you see a lot if you look at kind of, you know, the, you, you run his name through the archives, so to speak, just really, you know, in our opinion, it was just the two bit hood that you, you couldn't cast this guy, look at him any better in a movie. Um, sort of this two bit mob hood guy, right? So um, he was in Stateville and somehow, I mean, I've always had just issues with this part of the story. 
Um, it was publicly kind of, you know, put out there via the Tribune that he said he was at the murder of Molly Delco. I think he gave a pretty credible amount of detail um, about what happened. Um, and then out of nowhere, um, what ended up hitting the Tribune was really he recanted, said, no, nope, was, I was just making it all up. Uh, I was just, you know, these guys know I'm crazy. I'm just having fun. I just thought I could get some time off my sentence. Um, you know, when has that ever worked out for anyone? No, I would, you know, they've <laughs> ever seen making a murder. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, Jimmy Reaney, um, maybe, maybe we'll go back to Dennis and you want to start with kind of telling us a little bit about the fabulous green Hornet, Jimmy Reaney and his relationship <laughs> to the case. Well, Jimmy Reaney was, as you said, he was a street soldier, low level, and he was mostly assigned to to go into establishments that maybe had the competitors shuffleboard game or pool table or jukebox pinball and make a offer to the owner to get rid of those and put theirs in or else. And if they didn't, they'd be back with usually a bottle of acid. They'd ruin the pool table. They'd ruin the pinball machine and brick through the window and all kinds of threats. But he was, he was mainly low level. Like you said, he was arrested for the, the, the lowest level of crimes. Uh, he was always the type of guy that they would get to. He would maybe be a driver for a bigger for a bigger crime, or he would be a... And, and uh, the MO you know, was acid, acid attacks. I should have added that. That was, the, you know, they had an MO with... He liked acid. acid. He poured it on the tables. And on right. TV, he would, you know, so he it was would, very disturbing. You'd have MO. a shuffleboard, and he'd pour the acid so you couldn't play it. And he'd throw it down the machine work so it couldn't be operated. But he, again, very low level. When it got to be where he confessed to the case, um, probably braggadocio, probably trying to um, arrange a deal for his case to get out. Maybe, maybe he was trying to take him off the scent of the real story. But um, I don't, I don't think in anything that's been reported either by. Lonnie or John back in the day or in the major papers before that indicate he was anywhere near uh, should have been in the crew that got rid of a newspaper. Room. Okay, Lonnie, um, tell us what, tell us what you know about Jimmy Arini and, and where he fits in all this. Uh, adding to what uh, Dennis said, uh, it, it's clear that Rini was um, in the circle of the, of the possibility that he knew people that were involved or maybe he personally was involved. He obviously had enough credibility to actually get Bobby Kennedy to come to Joliet uh, and with shovels and uh, go to a, a farm site, it took Rini out of the state bill and they went to uh, some uh, farming property. Um, actually, it's the Kozak property on Renwick Road uh, and dig, they dig, they dug several holes um, and found nothing, which uh, Kennedy found very frustrating. And he made a joke about it in his book, The Enemy Within, where he makes like a paragraph reference to it. Um, but what, what's interesting and, and is worth sharing now is, is that Reini himself, after a column that uh, John Whiteside wrote uh, in the Herald News, Reini actually called John uh, and they had a conversation, they had a chat. And as usual, uh, in Reaney style, Green Hornet style, um, he loved to talk about his exploits in crime, his career in crime, and the things he was able to get away with and that sort of thing. Um, he did not say, oh, uh, I, I was involved in uh, the Molly disappearance, but he, he had a lot of fun talking about what it was like dragging Bobby Kennedy around this property. Uh, and he said, that uh, Kennedy got so frustrated that Kennedy smacked him in the head with a shovel. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it makes an interesting image. Um, and, uh, but the thing that, that uh, bothers me uh, about Reini uh, still is that he, he, he was in the right place at the right time and he had the background that kind of fit with some of this. And his words to Whiteside uh, were, well, John, Maybe one of these days I'll tell you the real story. I'll tell you everything, uh, but he would never go beyond that. Um, and and again, it could be just Reini. 
just really being really. Uh, but I, I have to wonder uh, at times whether or not this guy had some information that would have helped a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I listen to the interview tapes. And uh, if you listen to the podcast, we have um, an entire episode really dedicated to these tapes. And uh, they, <laughs> uh, they go from PG-13 R <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, with some of the analogies, but uh, it, uh, it, you know, my reaction, he's, he literally brags about robbing a church, you know, laughing at kind of how he got started and him being in prison and, you know, the things he was doing in prison and getting away with. And, you know, it was my sense when, you know, we kind of had little bits and pieces, I think of the interviews, but, you know, when, when John kind of puts this Molly thing is he, he, he clams up, suddenly he can't remember how to talk and brag about things. And, he kind of says, well, well, they said I was here and I bought this stuff at a store and he just, you, you can't, but I, I mean, I probably would be scared too if I was naming some of the people he was naming in the newspaper um, <laughs> and implicating them, even probably, you know, 40, 50 years later, I'd still be a little nervous. So um, that's one thing that always struck me about, about Jimmy is just that he just, he keeps going and going and just talks about what an awful person he is the awful things he does with a certain measure of pride, like anyone would, you know, look back on their career glowingly and talk about some of their <laughs> proudest accomplishments. But I just always got the sense he clammed up when discussing Molly. And I still just for the life of me, I cannot put together, you know, why this was so obviously and so meticulously put out there by Bobby Kennedy. Um, Bobby Kennedy in 1957, you know, the Kennedy brothers were really coming on the national scene. And, um, you know, many of us now know Bobby Kennedy is more of the post JFK assassination conciliatory Bobby Kennedy. Um, but he was known as ruthless at the time in the fifties when he was coming up, he had reporters asking him to his face. What do you say that people say you're too ruthless to hold office, to be attorney general, to be president. Um, so I just, it's hard for me to believe that he's just going to let himself be made a fool of publicly by the Green Hornet. And, um, I did actually, let's go to, I have the passage here from the book and then maybe I know Dennis, you have some, some thoughts about that, but let's read the passage from, uh, the enemy within that talks about this. And I know that text is small, so I'll, I'll read it out loud. Um, this is verbatim from the book written by Bobby Kennedy about this, uh, this incident where he comes to Joliet to search for Molly. So sometimes the leads we received were as fruitless as they were promising. At one time, for instance, uh, Jim McShane, and Jim McShane was a noted investigator who accompanied Bobby in, in conjunction with the McClellan Committee where they were really rooting out the mob and rooting out ties to um, organized crime, organized labor, politics. Um, Jim McShane and I visited a prisoner in Joliet in connection with our jukebox investigation. He told us that he had participated in the shooting of a local newspaper woman who had been opposing the activities of certain racketeers in the Joliet area. He said that they had buried her in Lyme in a field some miles away. I arranged with Warden Reagan for the prisoner to be released temporarily. Then, taking some picks and shovels, we drove to the field. He told us where to dig, and we dug. The farmer who owned the field came out from his house, and our prisoner friend warned us to be careful because the farmer knew about the murder. When the farmer asked what we were doing, Jim McShane, ever resourceful, implied we were from the state of Illinois and hinted we were looking for a special kind of rare metal. After we had dug in vain for some time, the prisoner took us to another spot and said, she's definitely buried here. I was tired of digging. He swore he was telling the truth and blurted out this quaint oath. May I have syphilis of the eyes and may my mother be a whore if she isn't buried here. Um, that's very on brand for Rini, by the way, to say something like that. So. Um, I know a little about the man's mother or his eyes, but Jim McShane and I both know after hours of digging that the woman's body was not there. At this juncture, the farmer came out again, this time with three very husky looking sons. So we took off across the fields. Um, Dennis, what do you think about this? Well, I find it, I find it interesting that in, in this excerpt from The Enemy Within, that Molly Zucco's name is not mentioned. He does say newspaper woman, local, but he does not say her name. And 
coincidentally, I read a, another book by Sam Giancana on some problems and it mentioned an incident in 57, which I later will bring out that I think led to the mobs uh, causing her disappearance. And he never mentioned her in that story too. In fact, the mob got terrifically silent, almost terrifyingly silent um, right after she disappeared. And she never, her name wasn't mentioned by the mob, probably was forbid to be mentioned. And it wasn't even mentioned by Bobby Kennedy. I think Reaney, if he was really knew something, I think he'd have probably had some cement shoes also. I think they, the mob knew he was just a bragger and a low level guy and let him talk and let him lead them around by the nose. But uh, if he really was involved, I think they were so covering up their story so well that, uh, and there was, and, and Lonnie knows there was a, a lot of blood in 57 in the Chicago mob. He would have joined them. I don't think he was really knowledgeable at all. With that, um, that really takes us, I think, you know, at least when you look at the media um, in 1957, really some of the last things you see, the, the Rini stuff came out not, you know, a year or so, a little less than that maybe after Molly's disappearance. And um, from there you just see an occasional mention, it's been two years since Molly disappeared, it's been five. And, you know, I think that story was very nearly lost, completely lost to time. Um, that is until 1978. And, you know, Lonnie, I don't think, you know, the people who are listening, I think many of them, most of them are, again, are familiar. People talk to me about that newspaper series, like it, like it's still going on. <laughs> and, and in a way it is. So, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, that moment, this career changing, life changing moment when Molly came into your life in 1978 and, and, and what happened after that? Sure. Uh, and, and it was uh, life changing. Um, John Whiteside uh, typed up a little note to his editors uh, saying that he'd like to do a little Sunday package on this woman that uh, used to be a newspaper editor in town and disappeared and you keep bumping into people that are talking about it. And he said they thought it would make an interesting article. Uh, and he got the go ahead for that. And he goes out and he discovers uh, quickly uh, that everybody, everybody that he talked to had a Molly story. Uh, they knew her, they knew people that knew her, uh, they worked for her or they worked for the spectator. Uh, he just discovered that there is a lot out in the Joliet community about Molly, a lot of memories. Um, as he liked to do on occasion, uh, he would call me in to help with packages that he knew were gonna get bigger. Uh, and I am so glad he did. Um, it turned out to be the story, the biggest story that either one of us would ever have in our careers, uh, story I'm still working on. Um, the, the amazing uh, part of this is that uh, when we started digging into it, um, we actually found a woman who lived on Stryker Avenue in 1957. Uh, she turned out to be a witness. Uh, she told us that she saw a woman's body buried in, in an open ditch on Stryker Avenue, um, where they were putting in a sanitary sewer line. Um, and so our lead, in fact, our lead off story uh, in the 12 part series was the, the witness. We put this witness under hypnosis twice, um, got more detail. That also was reported in the series. Um, it, uh, for us, it was shocking. I mean, you start out doing a feature uh, on local lore, uh, and then you end up finding a person that uh, thinks they know where the body is actually buried. Um, and I could get into that more if you want. So we'll go over to Dan, because we do have some questions about it. It's going to be our next question. But, uh, you know, 1978 for you, Dennis, is also really when you got involved with this story and can you tell us about that that first day, that first reaction when the story came to you? Sure, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, Lonnie and John's story came out and there was an episode every day. Uh, couldn't wait for the next one to come out and it had become, I was at the tavern then and uh, it had become quite a conversation piece at the tavern. Like Lonnie said, uh, a lot of people were 
working in Joliet. They knew about Molly. They, they'd heard about Molly. And everybody seemed to have a, not just a Molly story, but they every, all, everybody seemed to know what happened to her. Their uncle worked here and heard this, or I was at the spectator and heard that. But everybody had an opinion, but there were no answers. Um, Lonnie's story had the effect on me as a mystery fan. And as I got into it and uh, read the first couple articles, um, about the fourth or fifth day, I was in the tavern early in the morning and, and only one guy was in there. It was a local um, outdoorsman. And just like Lonnie's witness on Stryker Avenue, we got talking about the newspaper series that they were writing. And he says, you know, I think I seen her that night. And he began to tell me a story, something that happened to him out in a strip mine pit. And so just as Lonnie and John's story went in one direction in Joliet, my story kind of went another direction out in the local quarries. And there, as I researched it, there was supporting evidence for it. And here we are this day, both of us on our separate stories. And sitting on both sides of the room of each other, very <laughs> dramatic fashion, if you guys can see this there, visually. <laughs> just to touch on that, it, it could possibly be, and I mentioned this to you guys earlier this week, working on toying with a scenario where we're both right. And we'll talk about that later. One of my favorites. Uh, so that just gets us right to the question and then, you know, maybe we'll start, we'll, we'll go back to Lonnie, who can walk us through a little more and then Dennis will go back to you. Um, what are your leading theories as to Molly's ultimate fate and whereabouts, Lonnie? Right. Um, there are, and even as we were working on the series in 1978, um, there was a real strong possibility that uh, Molly had staged this. She had been telling people she was going to kick off her shoes and, oh, there were the shoes um, in front of her apartment uh, the night she disappeared. Maybe she set it up and she went into some sort of witness protection program. Um, FYI, the, uh, officially the witness protection program didn't exist until the early 60s. That does not mean that they didn't do that with people. They didn't hide them and protect them. And is it possible? Yes. Uh, it's, it's a theory that you can follow through and uh, it's kind of a prayerful uh, story, a uh, wishful story, wishful thinking. Um, there were a lot of people and there are still some people to this day, I've interviewed a family who think that Molly was uh, buried in uh, Francis Curry's front porch uh, because there was work being done on it, on it into the evening hours the night that she disappeared. Um, uh, again, a lot of people believe that at the time. Um, then, of course, uh, uh, the uh, most common, uh, there are a lot of uh, varieties of where she was buried, but there are a lot of people who thought that, that because of all the construction that was going on at the time, she's under I-80 or she's in some embankment somewhere, or as uh, Dennis noted, uh, she was given cement shoes in the, uh, one of the pits in the Coal City area. Um, all, all of these, uh, when we were working on the series, uh, we considered somewhat credible and we wanted to consider all of them. Then uh, we got the witness. Um, but because of the witness that uh, we found in um, 1978, um, I've discounted all the others. Uh, I'm kind of personally obsessed with the Stryker Avenue theory. And there's a reason for that. It's more than just the witness that uh, we found. Um, in, uh, oh, let's see, what year was it? 1986. Uh, John had written a column, kind of an anniversary column. He kept the Molly story alive in his columns in the newspaper. And he had written a column uh, reminding people about the Molly mystery. And, and he, it basically was designed to kind of give, uh, give background and uh, let people know about the case. But it was kind of also a plea to solve a mystery that the community really needed to be, uh, needed to be solved. Um, and uh, he let it go at that. And this is one of those things that journalists do now and then. They write these uh, stories or, or columns and they think somebody out there knows and who knows, maybe they'll, maybe they'll call. Well, this time it worked. Um, he, uh, shortly after he wrote that column, he got a letter. Turned out uh, the letter came from a gentleman who worked for the construction crew putting in that sanitary sewer line on Stryker Avenue in 1957. 
uh, and he told a story about his day uh, uh, working that site, how he was called off the job uh, early and told, uh, told to leave, don't worry about it. Um, it was his job to make sure that the line was put in uh, at uh, the proper specs, um, cover up the pipe that was put in uh, and make sure there were barricades up and so that it was safe. And then he was done for the day. Uh, he was told to leave early, which meant he left an open ditch. Uh, he was told just put some, uh, put some bombs, those little uh, black things that burn uh, that they set along uh, construction sites back then. Uh, so he, and he was told to do that and leave, don't worry about it. He came back the next morning and that section of line was covered up. Same night, Molly Zelko disappeared. So in his mind, there was a connection, always a connection. He did not tell anybody. Um, in fact, he didn't tell his own family until later, later in life. Um, but then he sat down, wrote that letter to John. In the end, we uh, interviewed him, uh, which I have taped, uh, and uh, he wrote two letters, another follow-up letter later, um, basically saying the same story. I have uh, since uh, talked to uh, his family, uh, relatives, uh, and they told me that he told them the same story later in life uh, after he had retired uh, and after I think it was after his wife passed. He was, he was very concerned about telling anybody anything because he was concerned about the safety of his family. Um, so I got we have him telling what he saw and I have family members now saying he told the same story. Um, then I'll add one other thing. Um, the witness that we had in uh, 1978, um, had some issues. She's never been identified, um, and I will identify her in the book. I probably don't think I'll do that tonight. Um, but I have said in the past that I've had that back in 78, we had some concerns, we had some issues uh, with her credibility. Um, I can say uh, now that I no longer have those issues because at that time we didn't know about the construction worker. Um, and so that added a lot of weight to the Stryker Avenue story. Um, but we did have some concerns back then because we thought that if she was, that she might have some reason or she thought she would benefit it, uh, with this story um, somehow. Um, but uh, that, it's not true. We, uh, especially if you uh, uh, look at the transcripts of what we got from her when she was uh, under hypnosis. Uh, the first hypnosis, she was, uh, she lived through that terror and you could see that she was terrified. Her entire body was shaking in a this big leather chair. So anyway, um, I tracked down, uh, working on the book now, I tracked down uh, her, uh, some of her family, her oldest daughter and a son who were together uh, in another state. Uh, and I was talking to the oldest daughter and my basic question, my, in fact, the main reason I went to talk to them was to see if their mother had shared any of the story with them uh, and if they believed it. And my basic question was, do you really think that your mother saw something that night, the night that Molly disappeared? Did she see a body uh, thrown into that ditch? And the oldest daughter uh, looked at me and she said, oh yeah, yeah, I believe her because I was there. I was in the room also. So bam, I, I've got another witness, uh, the, her daughter who she was 10 years old at the time and her mother was telling her to stay down and be quiet. Uh, but she still looked and she still saw much of what our witness saw and told us that. Um, so I've got a situation where we've got, I've got two witnesses plus a construction crew, uh, a man who worked on the Stryker Avenue project. To me, that's too compelling to ignore. And um, I really like to see local law enforcement uh, or some official leadership in the Joliet area uh, want to pay attention to this. Um, and I, you know, the, uh, the hypnosis, I, I believe kind of very famously kicked off the series, right? And we had the illustration and or it was an early part of the series and you shared the tapes with us and we placed some excerpts from them on the podcast and man, they're chilling. It's it just, it, <laughs> Um, if, if that's acting, it's great acting. Cause I mean, like you said, you, you hear the fear, the terror, um, very genuine, very authentic. Um, and, um, I think that also kind of speaks to doing a podcast, you know, you, 
you wrote about them very well at the time, but when you hear them, um, and you're able to hear them by the podcast, it just really, it, it's something. Um, so again, you know, two theories, maybe they clash, maybe one's right, maybe yours is right, maybe they're both wrong, maybe they're both right, who knows. Um, but Dennis, we do have some compelling things about an alternative location. Can you talk about that? Right, right. My experience was much like Lonnie, um, as far as a witness being terrified. When, when, this, when this guy in the tavern told me the story, he made sure nobody else was in the place. He looked over his shoulders. He's a big burly man, booming voice, and he could barely get the story out in whispers. His eyes were large and, and, and there, there was fear in his voice. When, when Molly disappeared, um, the story only had legs maybe about a month. By, by October, it had disappeared. And other than um, the local papers, the, the two authorities that kept it going were the Tribune with their crime desk and a guy by the name of Sandy Smith and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And their crime desk was led by, uh, by uh, Ted Link. Ted Link was a Pulitzer Prize uh, reporter, crime reporter, who had what he called a grapevine. He had inside connections to both law enforcement and the mob. He was always seemed to be inside on every story. And, and even if he was in St. Louis, his beat was Springfield. And he, the Chicago mob was, he had many connections to the mob. But um, he was probably the, the, the most prolific in, in bringing the case to the newspaper readers. And at the end, his last story, he concluded that it was in his from his grapevine that his sources said that the body would be in the pits near Coal City. And that helped support my outdoorsman story. Since then, when I researched the problem or the location, I mean, there were a lot of coincidental things that happened on that particular site. And although there was hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands of acres of strip mines around here. That particular one had a lot of events happen, the such as the government ran bombing tests there, or dynamite tests there. The When Nixon was president in 1970, and the land was being developed, secret servicemen were on that location, observing the bulldozers moving the earth. Why would that be? There uh, are the land in 57, a pipeline was going through that and the Joliet Teamsters were uh, arrested for trying to strong arm the pipeliners to join their union. Um, a, lot of, a lot of activity on that particular property that just kept the, um, supported my theory and the story that was told to me. And so to this day, it's possible and uh, and maybe we're both right. Maybe we're both wrong. We'll never know till, till the next clues phone. Amen. Um, so we are getting, uh, it's about 13 after, it's exactly 13 after seven. So um, we'll go through these questions a little more rapid. Maybe I'll do one to Lonnie and one to Dennis here. Um, so we do have a little bit of time to take some feedback from the audience. Um, but, you know, again, I will say another plug for the podcast. Uh, I think we, we really kind of explore both theories in depth and in detail. And um, the podcast is, it's about eight, 30, 25, 30 minute episodes. Um, and I think that was as, as quickly as we could tell it. And I think in the podcast, you know, we, we all kind of said, like, we just want this to be an overview. So at four hours, that's your overview. Um, and, you know, we have... You know, I'm the newbie with maybe three or four years, I think. So that is about 85 years of collective experience researching this thing to death. Um, so uh, it just, it, it never stops. And it's something that always stays with us. And I mean, we talk about that too, just the emotion behind it and um, the mission behind it. So uh, Lonnie, what are some relevant details, those last critical hours the night Molly disappeared, what do we know about that? What are some, again, compelling things that maybe give us some evidence one way or the other, or do not give us some evidence for that matter, but 
what were her last few hours like? You can make some assumptions, but it's hard to be very conclusive. But based on uh, interviews that we had with people who worked with Molly and were with her uh, that uh, final day, um, she had spent a great deal of time in her office on the phone uh, working on what she said was an important project. Um, she had a, a private line installed in the office uh, a, a few weeks earlier. She was working on something uh, important, uh, apparently big, um, and the impression that she gave employees was that she had uh, reached a, a, a breaking point where she had uh, solved the problem or had accomplished her goal, uh, and she was in a good mood. Um, uh, and, Nobody saw that she was uh, depressed at all or uh, upset about anything. She was in a good mood, fiery. Um, what it was about is unclear. Um, some people can speculate uh, that it might have had something to do with her recent campaign to close down that new gambling operation uh, in, uh, uh, in downtown Joliet. Other people would speculate that uh, maybe she finally had figured out who had beaten up McCabe, but there was a long stretch in between 48 and 57 uh, for that, I think. But who knows? Anyway, uh, that, that occupied her day. Uh, there was nothing unusual. Uh, uh, perhaps it was a little unusual that she uh, left the building about 1130 that night. Uh, and often on, this was the night they put the press to bed, it would go to press the next day. Uh, and uh, generally she would work past, uh, they would be working past 11.30, but on this night they, were wrapped, they had wrapped it up at 11.30. She left, waved goodbye. Um, the, there were a couple printers that uh, would uh, follow her home on a regular basis to make sure she got home okay, so the whole fear factor was always there. Um, but that night uh, she just waved goodbye and nobody had a chance to follow her. Uh, and uh, there, there was one comment, uh, they said that they felt that she appeared to be in a hurry to get out of there. Um, other than that, um, nothing, nothing really stands out. Um, we did have, uh, after our series came out, we got a lot of feedback. I would have loved to have had social media back in 78, uh, but we got a lot of letters and phone calls. Uh, most everything was anonymous, but I, we did get a call uh, from a gentleman who uh, was willing to be quoted, uh, and he was a bartender uh, in uh, Joliet, uh, and said that he saw Molly come in that night uh, and uh, had a scotch and water, got a bunch of quarters uh, and made uh, some long distance phone calls. Um, that was back in the day where you went into these little booths and closed the door, telephones. And uh, she made some long distance calls. Uh, it was never really determined who she called, uh, but it adds a, uh, an interesting spin to the mystery that uh, the night that she disappeared and it might have had something to do with uh, her success earlier in the day with accomplishing some sort of goal, finding out information that she'd been trying to find out. Um, but, and, and I'm assuming that what this gentleman says is true and it never came out in the investigation. He never told police back in uh, 57. So, and it still fits in with the timeline. She could have gone there and done that and, and gone to her house and uh, still been kidnapped uh, our witness uh, who says that they uh, saw her uh, buried at, uh, saw a woman's body buried in Stryker Avenue that night, uh, witnessed that a little after 1 a.m. So the time frame still fits. Um, I, did I get off track? <laughs> no, perfect. And I think, you know, most people know the geography here, but I had pointed out at one time in another presentation that the newspaper office, Molly's house, literally across the Cass Street Bridge from each other. It almost took you longer to take the car. Um, so even with the stop, it was just really difficult in my mind to believe this was a crime of opportunity, knowing you would have to have it down to minutes um, if you were just robbing her or grabbing her. Um, so it, it really adds kind of that compelling notion that there was some premeditation with whatever happened. So. Um, and that picture is actually, uh, can everyone see the screen here? Um, that is the scene outside of Molly's house in, in, you know, the hours after she disappeared. And even, you know, she lived in that upper level apartment. Um, but just that walk from the car to the door was very short as well. And those shoes were found, um, you know, just, just outside the car there. 
he's found in the car also um so, so again just kind of compelling compelling it's all compelling um okay dennis um can you talk to us um my next slide up here talk to us a little bit about um the larger implications we have you know by design a spectator headline up there um a gentleman by the name of hyman larner red waterfall who was discussed in the days and weeks after this and implicated uh, Mr. Reedy there with his hands raised and his companion Ross, who, you know, noted people terrorizing. What was going on at the national level to maybe give us some clues, knowing that if you're going after a reporter, you're going to need to go very high up. So, you know, what, what would be the genesis of that hypothetically? If someone wants to do this, why? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Right, right. Up until 57, um, they weren't making much headway on their crusades and they weren't really bothering the Chicago mob. But they had enemies locally, to be sure. Um, McCabe and Molly had, had ruffled a lot of feathers. But by 57, the, the, as we said earlier, the mob had changed. It went from the old time um, mafia codes with Rika and Accardo where it, they felt it was bad business to, to, to mess with the press. They would never have done it. Um, but by 57 with Giancana there, he was more of a loose cannon. Uh, he didn't abide by the codes as well. The, he, and he was not well liked by the syndicate in the national level. The five families in New York um, had no regard for Giancana at the time. What would have happened, what would have happened though in Joliet is these enemies that weren't necessarily killers, if they wanted her to disappear, they would, they would have had to had to enlist somebody who did such as the Chicago outfit. And like you said, it would have went to the highest level, Sam Giancana at that time. And that's where I think the one event that happened that caused her to go, like Lonnie said, she was working on a case. I think she solved it. And your newspaper there on the side says another hood dumped here. And that's the one event. When Giancana was on the hot seat in 57, he had, he had been the subject of a lot of investigation over two or three murders in Chicago. And he needed to put the situation to rest. He was under orders to make it all in. And his last, um, his last act, he thought, was to kill a banker who had been a, a launderer and it was threatening to implicate him. And he hired his right-hand man, Willie Dodano, to take care of the banker. Well, Willie Dodano hired his, one of his soldiers, a guy by the name of Sal Moretti. Now Moretti did kill the banker, but he botched the job and left a lot of clues, clues that would lead right back to Sam Giancana. For that, Salvatore Moretti wound up in a trunk of a car full of bullet holes and the car was dumped in Joliet on Caton Farm Road. That headline that you see on the screen right now was Molly's headline. And with that headline, Giancana's problems just got dumped in Molly's lap. So her enemies in Joliet, now that would want the Chicago mob to do something about her, all they had to do, even if Molly was, the case she was working on wasn't the Moretti case, all they would have had to do was make Giancana think that she knew something. Giancana was in such a bind over his other problems that under orders to put things to rest. Now what he thought was the last key was the banker. Really the last key is the newspaper woman that's writing this story that you see. And I believe that sealed her fate. Fascinating. Um, I believe I read that there was a lot of pageantry with the Moretti hit. The pockets were cut out of his suit and a comb in the pocket about uh, sending a quite a graphic message about the importance of paying attention right, to right. detail. When he, when he killed the banker, he was ordered to clean out the banker's pockets and get the incriminating IOU to Giancana and a bank loan on a fraudulent bank loan and any other references. Well, he, for, he didn't get that. He left it there for the police. So when Moretti's body is found, they left only a comb with the message from the mob supposedly being Take, use a fine tooth comb whenever you go over, only when you leave a body. So 
Message that was received. that, and, and, and he, his family was in, uh, his brother was in Stateville for killing a, a policeman earlier in the 50s. And uh, once, he was, once he was dead, once Moretti was killed, the whole situation, the events before Moretti with the banker and the politicians, nothing ever was said for years. They went silent, and I think included in that going silent was the fact that the newspaper woman that might have wrote a story on him went silent too. Thank you. Uh, wow. So we are, uh, we're getting a lot of questions. This was a previously submitted question. So I'll kind of, I'll package this and send it over to you, Lonnie. Um, uh, Striker Avenue, people want to know this, this slide we're looking at right now, um, you know, this, I, I think, Right now, so many people remember that illustration that was used in the Herald News, um, kind of envisioning the Stryker Avenue witness, what she was seeing. Um, people are asking, um, this question specifically asked, you know, um, there were things that made her an unreliable witness. I think you you covered that. You covered really how you how you got past that and have that corroborated, but um I mean, people are kind of asking, you know, was Stryker Avenue looked at? Have there been any efforts? Did they dig? Did they do ground penetrating radar? If so, what might need to be done? Um, so what were your efforts in terms of, or the community's efforts with any resolution at Stryker Avenue? Right. Uh, to me, that is the burning question. Why didn't anybody look at Stryker Avenue? Uh, in 1978, uh, before our series uh, actually kicked off, we took our opening story uh, and our notes and uh, all the other details to uh, the state's attorney's office, told them what we had, told them what the initial story would say, so we had a heads up on it. Um, the bottom line was uh, that um, he was interested. Uh, he wanted to know details. He never asked the identity of the witness. Uh, no one ever asked for the identity of the witness. Um, and he basically laid it out this way. He said, it's been, and this was in 1978, it's been 21 years uh, since uh, Molly disappeared. Uh, there's a strong uh, likelihood that there's no one to arrest um, or prosecute, which is what I do as a state's attorney. Um, and if you wanna dig up Stryker Avenue, that's gonna be really expensive. It's not gonna come out of my budget, said the state's attorney. Uh, but then he, he also said, you know what, um, nothing is going to happen from my office, but if there's a public outcry, then uh, it becomes a little more political and I'll probably get involved. Um, there was no public outcry, uh, even back uh, at the Herald News where John and I worked, um, we uh, didn't editorialize uh, to dig up Stryker. There was no real strong push. And part of that might have been some of our uh, concern about the witness at that point in time, um, but uh, which doesn't exist now. Uh, so there wasn't a, there was no public outcry. There was no push. Uh, if we'd have had social media back then, so much would have been different. So now let me flash forward to um, current now. Um, all the, all the. Uh, evidence that I have that suggests that Stryker Avenue is something that should be looked at. Um, I have transcripts of all uh, the interviews uh, with the people that I mentioned. Um, I, I have uh, met with uh, cold case, uh, Will County cold case squad uh, present uh, at that meeting uh, was a gentleman from the state's attorney's office. Um, they have a flash drive with all that information. Um, they, probably are looking at it the same way the state's attorney did back in uh, 1978. Well, it's gonna cost a lot of money to dig up Stryker Avenue. It'll have to be treated like a crime scene. That's even more expensive. In fact, the digging of it will have to involve something more than a backhoe. Um, so that's a lot of money. It's not gonna come out of my budget because there definitely is no one around to prosecute anymore. Uh, but I still believe that maybe if there were a public outcry uh, some public concern. I know the Zelko family would really like to have some answers. Um, the other factor to throw in, of course, is that uh, for expecting a leader to step forward and get involved and try to solve this uh, is the political potential political embarrassment, uh, Al Capone's vault. Uh, uh, 
uh, it's very possible that uh, after 60 some years, uh, they could dig up uh, Stryker Avenue, uh, even if it's done carefully, uh, and find nothing, which uh, certain people would find uh, embarrassing. I frankly would not, uh, I just need to know. <laughs> um, after all this research uh, over the years and the information that I have, um, to me, it's a compelling question. Thanks, Lonnie. Um, we got a <laughs> kind of a random question about why was Jimmy Arini named the Green Hornet? Um, I, he, <laughs> you know, he claimed that he was just so well known in Chicago as a, a, a burglar and a safe cracker that the cops gave him this nickname. I mean, I, I'm inclined to believe like, you know, Jimmy, the, he, they're not that into you. You clearly gave that nickname to yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, he, Jimmy Arini, just a care. You could not cast this guy any better, you know, but I don't know if you have different thoughts about that, but now he's got that. <laughs> um, I think part of the stories that I read was that he was like a second story man. He, was, he considered himself very agile and very good at getting in and out of windows. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the Green Hornet uh, series uh, years ago, uh, but uh, he, he considered himself very sneaky, never getting caught, good at getting in and out. <laughs> I, I just say yeah, every time I think of Jimmy Arena in those interviews, uh, listen to the podcast if you haven't. It's uh, worth your time. Uh, so we we, we kind of skipped over a couple things, but it's 730. So maybe, you know, I think we want to wrap up the official part of this. Certainly, you know, I can stay for a few minutes. I don't know, gentlemen, if you're willing to stay for a few minutes, answer any questions. I think we've got most of them. But, um, you know, and then maybe I think did we want to turn it over to our friends from the library after this? and. Um, just kind of, you know, allow them to talk a little bit about what this all means and, and the partnership between the museum and the library to do projects like this. But, um, you know, in my mind, uh, a really compelling statistic um, about Molly's legacy is that, you know, ostensibly presuming she was killed. And I mean, I, what I fall back on is, you know, there was talk about witness protection. She made herself disappear. Um, and we have those kind of conspiracy theories. Um, you know, I think the family believes she was killed universally. So um, I'm inclined to take the view of the family. Um, so that puts her in league as one of only three journalists in the history of our state um, to be killed in the line of duty. And the only female journalist to be killed in the line of duty in the entire history of Illinois. Um, one of those being Elijah Lovejoy, who you know, very famously in the very early days of Illinois was killed for his stance on slavery and um, Jake Lingle in the 1930s. And, you know, Dennis, you've talked about him. He was very much a mobbed up journalist and really, you know, kind of too close with the outfit and was kind of set his mouth kind of got him there. So you, you really, you know, it's more like two honest journalists or ethical journalists that um, were killed and Molly being one of those, but um you know, I mean, she she's courageous. I mean, you know, certainly an incredibly strong woman, but I don't even think you have to use the qualifier for a woman. I think she was incredible, tough, courageous. Uh, she brokered power. She played the game. She slated candidates. She was fearless. Um, and, you know, we've used this picture of her on this slide throughout, but, you know, I think this is just all this kind of iconic, tough, resolute image that, in Joliet, we all have a Molly. I think Joliettans kind of have this special identification with Molly um, as someone who really represents the city and the history's history of our city, the toughness of our city, um, the grit. And, you know, really at the end of the day, you know, certainly, you know, Lonnie is a career journalist and we talk a lot about journalism today and politics and what it means and how important it is. And, you know, it's the importance and the price of an independent media. Um, and how high that price can be sometime and how high it was in Joliet. Um, so she's important. We, I certainly think, and I'll turn it over to both of you to allow you know, a couple minutes to talk about that, but um, this story means something. It's important. The closure is important. The resolution is important. Um, the family getting answers is important. So, you know, again, it's, it's become a meme. And even in, in, um, our friend Ted Sloak, who's also a journalist, you know, wrote a song about Molly. And I mean, like, so she just has this legendary status and you sometimes almost forget this was a real thing that happened 
62 and a half years ago, um, not that long ago. So um, what does it, Dennis, what does it, what does it all mean? What's your, what's your thoughts about Molly's legacy and why we're still talking about this story 60 plus years later? Well, I think journalism in the 50s, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, if you count McCabe in the story, was way different than now. I mean, we're, we're living in an era where we just went through three or four years of fake news and the political um, struggles that existed because applying what everybody one side would point fake news, the other side would point the other one. Uh, back then it was, it, the journalistic school was, you used the headlines to um, support your friends and, and punish your enemies. And McCabe had learned that in his first uh, career as a newspaper man. And he was the true crusader of the two. He, Molly became a crusader because she absorbed McCabe's stances. His enemies were her enemies. His friends were her friends. His editorial slant was her editorial slant. And she took it maybe a tad too deep by the 50s. But uh, journalism was then used to um, accomplish your goals, accomplish a personal agenda. And hers was one to uh, atone for McCabe's beating, but also to continue his crusade against the corruption of the day, whether it had been organized crime or political corruption or businessmen that rigged contracts, whatever the, whatever the segment was, she used journalism to fight those fights and she paid for it. Well said. And I, you know, I think we, we say it on the podcast that these lines between labor and business and government and crime were all, all kind of much more blurry back then than they are now in, in kind of this, the information age we live in. Um, Lonnie, can I ask you the yeah, same, same question? Why are we still talking about Molly, why should we mute myself? Why are we still talking about Molly? And why should we, why should we still continue to talk about Molly and keep this torch lit? I think we're still talking about Molly because uh, there's a huge question mark o over the whole story. What happened to Molly? So, and there's, I think in this community, I know still with the family, uh, still hope that uh, there can be some solution, uh, some answer to that question, which I feel like I have uh, come up with uh, uh, sufficient information to at least go down a path, at least check it out, look into it further. Um, you noted earlier, I'm working on a book and that's a slow process. I find myself researching more than writing, uh, turn over stone and there's three more stones. Um, but that it's a fascinating story. And that's another reason why it, it's still alive. It's a fascinating story. It's, it's got the mob. You know, it's got Bobby Kennedy digging holes in uh, Will County. Uh, and it's got Molly, a woman in, in 1957, in the 50s, of power and influence, which uh, I, I, is kind of unheard of uh, in the 50s. Uh, so the story is, uh, I, I, I think, um, a story, it's like folklore. It's just, it's, it's being repeated to new generations, uh, which is why I really appreciate the podcast you did because it did an excellent job of introducing to a new generation. Um, the book I'm working on is going to take some time, but the real dilemma I have with this story uh, is uh, the Striker Abbey. It's the it's the final chapter, and it's still I can't write it because it's not done yet. Oh, uh, wow. Well put. Well, um, again, we're going to go quickly with some audience questions. And uh, did we want to bring in, are we able to bring in Matt from the library, Liz? Is he with us? Uh, Matt Gaelic from the Joliet Public Library and uh, Megan, Matt, Don, the team at the library, um, you know, they, we have to give them a lot of credit because they, they approached us, um, you know, doing I'm echoing here, so let me finish. <laughs> um, they, they were very generous with us in terms of just, they approached us saying, how in the wake of COVID, knowing you guys can't do in-person events, knowing you guys can't do the things that help you survive, can we help? Um, and this is part of that. And they've been such a wonderful partner to us. And as I alluded to in the beginning, 
this whole story, the podcast, doing this tonight, I think kind of talks about that kinship between libraries, museums, journalists, research, historians, and why we're all here tonight and why we can all still talk about this and, and that we can use our organizations decades apart to still be carrying this torch, as I said earlier. So uh, Matt, thank you. Are you with us? I need to put you back on speaker here. So you're on, Matt. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So yeah, in whoa. <laughs> I will not talk after this. <laughs> so in terms of um, resources that we have at the library that one could use to learn more about the whole Molly Belko case, uh, we do have a pretty in-depth file on her in our local history section uh, that's made up of lots of newspaper clippings from the, uh, the time she disappeared. And uh, I think a lot of the, um, the John Whiteside columns might be in that file, too. Uh, and, of course, we also have uh, a nearly complete run of the spectator here on microfilm. Uh, I believe there's a small gap in the 1960s, but aside from that, it's pretty much a complete run. So um, all of her stuff is in there, and also um, all the coverage of her disappearance uh, is represented here too in the microfilm. And uh, we also have a, um, a complete run of the Herald News as well, so uh, going uh, all the way up to today. So uh, that would be another resource that researchers could use uh, if they were uh, trying to get, get on the trail of uh, Mavi Zelko and the events of uh, 1957. Matt, thank you. Yes, uh, I, I think this shows that we are, our organizations are relevant then, now for research um, we, we're just so grateful to the library and again that, you know, we, we can, we can do this and the continuity is just so cool. Um, so maybe we can make sure to just kind of, uh, on our Facebook, we can post some things and maybe some of this information to people about, you know, what you can find out at the library. Um, that slide, if everyone can see that slide, a few people ask where you can find the podcast, um, website or all your favorite podcasts entities we we put it everywhere where you can find any kind of major podcast so um hope that's helpful and people asked about the um the 1978 herald news lani and that's on your you have a dedicated facebook page um that if folks want to follow do you want to give a quick shout for that uh thank you uh, i created a facebook page uh I just do a search on molly zelko mystery and you should should be able to find it um, I did post on that, uh, that page uh, all 12 parts of the series. It's there if you want to read it. Um, also, uh, you can find some uh, photos that I took of the uh, apartment that Molly lived in. Um, and I, I can uh, also add that uh, you might have come up with some questions tonight that we're not answering. If you want to pop a question on that Facebook page, I'll do my best to answer it. And, uh... And maybe we'll we'll take a couple here. Uh, I, yeah, I kind of like this one um, from Kathy. Thank you. Uh, what about Rika's farm and Curry, who managed it? Was the farm ever considered a site? I don't know if we've even talked about that. That's a great observation, <laughs> Dennis. Would you have? Okay, we'll go back to Dennis. All right, I'm sorry. The question was about Rika. Uh, Curry managed a farm for Rika. We talked about that earlier. Was that considered a potential location? Why or why no, not? No, what I was trying to say was uh, Rika sold the farm in 1951. Um, his time in prison had cut his earning power a lot, and uh, he was uh, uh, liquidating a lot of assets going into the 50s. The uh, Keith Offer hearings were going on and he was in danger of being uh, deported at the time. Uh, sold it to a lawyer from New York by the name of Condon who 
incidentally was uh, his parole officer was also named Condon. Uh, no idea if that was related, but I think it was. But Francis Curry, uh, by when she went missing in 57, the farm had been out of their hands for six years. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, we've had several people asking, and this was covered. We did do a lot about this tonight, but um, Molly's romantic life, there was, you know, even at the time, someone mentioned the diamond ring story. So, I mean, in, in my mind, you know, it was, we talked about kind of the gender implications of the era and this just sometimes it was thinly veiled. Sometimes it was not thinly veiled about, you know, Molly had furs and diamonds, and this was just introduced into the story in a way that I certainly don't think it, it would have been if she were a man. Um, so, you know, Lonnie, what do we kind of, there was a lot of innuendo. Um, and again, I think it, it kind of goes back to Molly's status as a woman, as you've mentioned, she would typically not occupy a place like this in society in the 50s. So what was said, what do we know, you know, without getting too into the weeds on that? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. Uh, first of all, love life. Um, there were some people that thought that she had some sort of a romantic relationship with McCabe. Um, some of them were really sure of it and based on observations, but uh, there was like a 26 year difference. Uh, so if they had a relationship, I suspect when it was when he was a lot younger. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't have any proof that they had a relationship like that. I do know that they were bonded, never separated to the end. Um, she uh, was, according to her uh, close friends, uh, she was engaged. Um, that would have been, let's see, she was 22 uh, when she was engaged to a gentleman by the name of um, Martin Sheik, uh, who was 23. Uh, his father was a former city commissioner. And um, January 2nd, 1933, he was killed uh, when he, uh, his car collided with a train in the Coal City area. Um, to the best of my knowledge, she never had a serious relationship beyond that. Um, it doesn't mean she didn't go out and have a good time now and then, but uh, I, I do believe that that's pretty much where her love life was, uh, was limited, so she never married. Um, and the uh, rest of the question was... You know, someone asked about the diamond ring, and I skipped oh, okay. that. So we had a slide. We were kind of running on, right, on time. Right. but uh, She had a 17.5 carat uh, ring, uh, which is a rock that's so big, you just don't carry it out, wear it very often, um, which she purchased uh, for $5,000 from a good friend, uh, Bergland, Alice Bergland, um, who had ties to this, uh, the spectator. Her family owned it at one point in time. Um, uh, at the time that Molly disappeared, there was uh, media attention on how a woman uh, could have fur coats and all this jewelry, um, expensive jewelry. Uh, it never really went anywhere other than that there was the speculation that where did she get the money? Um, it's, it, there are some people that, well, first of all, the diamond ring was valued at, that, that huge diamond ring was valued at like $35,000 back then. Back then. Um, she got it for five, so it was hugely discounted. Um, I think that uh, Bergman knew that she really loved it. Uh, Molly loved shoes. <laughs> um, she loved fashion. She, loved, she had uh, mink coats, uh, and she loved jewelry. Um, as far as I know, though, I think that's pretty much uh, all she ever really splurged on. I think she lived a, a pretty... Uh, simple life. Uh, her apartment was small. Um, I think her entire life, as her friend said, her marriage was to the spectator uh, and dedication was to the spectator. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, uh, it, I knew this question would come up and I'm, I don't have a really good answer, although it's interesting. It's easy today to say, how, she, how could she come up with $5,000? But um, I, I did a, one of those Google searches to, to see what, what would $100 be uh, worth today versus 1957. So $100 in 1957 today would be worth over $900. Um, so there's a big, we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about $5,000 being a huge amount of money. Also, it, Molly had friends in high places. Um, it's very possible that she was able to get by that ring uh, with the help of friends, including McKay. Thank you. Um, well, we got an interesting one here that just came in uh, from Dean. 
his father, Carl, was the printing foreman at the Spectator from 1946. Lonnie's going to be reaching out to you probably. Um, until 62, he was one of the two people that you mentioned that usually followed Molly home from work on Wednesday night. He did not follow her the night of her death because she left earlier than usual and she told him not to bother that evening. When the Spectator was sold, he returned to the Herald News until he retired in the 1980s. Interviewed by local police and the FBI, but not Whiteside. Does that ring a bell or? <laughs> no, actually we did interview. Like, he's talking about Carl Zeke. Um, Carl Zeke, yeah. oh, and, interesting. And we did interview yeah. him um, and he, he pretty much told us the details, a lot of the details that I shared tonight. Um, I also know that uh, Carl, I, I think, was personally haunted by what happened. Um, I think it really, really bothered him that uh, he didn't go with her that night, uh, even though she pushed him away. And, uh, you know, she made it clear she didn't want anybody messing with her that night. She was going. And, and it could be because she wasn't going home. She was going to that tavern to make those phone calls. Um, but I know that Carl was really, really bothered by uh, what happened to Molly. And he had a, he had a great deal of respect for her. Although he did, he also said that she could be a tyrant to work for. In fact, he, he might've been one of the printers who told us that he had quit more than once, but Molly got him, talked him back. Because uh, Molly could be a rough boss. So she had the final say on everything. So. Yeah, that's something we consistently heard as well. Um, tough to work for, tough, tough all around. Um, I had one, maybe it's uh, somewhere else now. Um, yeah, because we, this is another compelling one, too, because we did have some evidence that maybe there was some stuff left behind. Uh, from Lori, any idea if Molly left notes or work on what she was last working on? And I think we, there was stuff written. I don't know how accurate it was about some things that disappeared from there. The office was cleaned out. Do you, what, you remember hearing or reading or writing about, about that? Uh, yes, they, they did uh, look in her office. She had, uh, she had a, a package of envelopes wrapped in a ribbon, um, and she had left instructions uh, to the staff that if anything ever happens to me, burn it, get rid of it. Um, they never found it. Um, the uh, calendar, her calendar for September 26 was gone. It was missing in her calendar. Uh, just which raises some interesting questions. Why? Wow. Yeah. Um, and there were uh, other files in the office that were gone. Uh, how someone got in the office and when they got in the office to get rid of that material, who would have done that? Um, I don't have any, uh, any uh, information to, to answer that, uh, other than it's, it was reported that stuff was missing. Uh, so uh, what was she working on still remains a mystery. Can I kick that over to you on this? Do you have any, anything, oh, just, anecdotal, anything, you know, what was Molly maybe working on? Were there things, did anything disappear? No, not much other than to piggyback on Lonnie, there was, there was supposedly a file wrapped in a pink ribbon that her secretary, Charlotte, I won't mention the last name, was told to either get rid of or another story might have said to give it to her brother, but I don't know which one of them held water. And when they went there to, when in the investigation, it wasn't gone and it wasn't indicated if it was gone because of the secretary or if it had been stolen, nobody knew what happened to it. So um, that plus other files never were found. Interesting. Um, I think we've, we've Covered this, we're getting asked uh, cadaver dogs on Stryker Avenue. Really no meaningful investigation on Stryker Avenue. I don't know if you want to answer this directly, but maybe indirectly, we're getting a couple questions about, do you know about where on Stryker Avenue? That can be a yes or no question. You don't have to say, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we don't want any, you know, unauthorized digging or sleuthing, but do, do we kind of have an idea of a narrow down area on Stryker Avenue? Yeah, I, I can uh, pinpoint it based on conversations with the witness who uh, was staring at it uh, and the uh, gentleman who worked for the construction crew. I can pin it down pretty close. Uh, and the law enforcement people that I've talked with know that also. 
and as far as I know, nothing has ever really been done. Yeah, it seems to uh, seems to also meet what we we found also in in our research. A couple of questions about. Has there ever been, you know, we've talked about the podcast as kind of a means to research this and bring this to life. Has the family told you about any crowdfunding efforts? Has there been any kind of meaningful way if, if the roadblock is budgetary and money, have there been efforts to raise this money or are we still at kind of the point where we're just hoping that the awareness snowballs into that no effort to raise money that i know of um although i've mentioned to people that if uh, we could build a fire um, there are a lot of people who would donate um, i think that if uh, some agency were to decide that they were going to try and do something with this the city the county state um, if they were to give us a price tag uh, i would do what i could to help raise money for it so it wouldn't have to be tax dollars and I think a GoFund uh, would be quite successful, to be uh, honest with you. I don't know if it could raise the full amount, but I, I, I know there's people that uh, are just as curious as I am and, and would throw in a buck or two to see it happen. And that was for Tanya. Tanya, hello, Tanya. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and then, you know, so a couple of follow-up questions. Where is this case at legally? Is it still considered an open case? Kind of what would that process look like you know if we were there was going to be a meaningful investigation can you talk about the jurisdiction kind of who you know what what that looks like people are curious about that uh, i'd say the case uh, is dead in the sense that the jurisdiction issue um someone someone has to pick up uh, uh the baton and run with it uh, and and I suspect if the state wanted to do it, the city would say, fine, uh, the city wanted to do it. Uh, it's actually in city jurisdiction. Um, if the county wanted to do it, the city would probably say, fine, because no one wants to spend the money probably. I don't really know. Um, I haven't had a, a, a face to face conversation uh, with the state's attorney or city officials. Um, I'm kind of waiting for the COVID uh, dust to settle um, and uh, some of the chaos in city government to settle, to be perfectly honest. Thank you. Uh, Brother Ed, I think we've met on Facebook, Brother Ed, I know you're a history guy. Uh, any TV clippings of Molly's disappearance that we are aware of? That's a good question, interesting question. I don't know that I've located any, but newsreels, anything like that. A lot of print, a lot of magazines, newspapers, but any anything on that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I actually am not aware of any, but I, I'll, I'll have to also say that I haven't uh, tried to find any. Um, and there might be some uh, archived out there. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me because uh, this was national news uh, in uh, September of 19, in October of 1957. It was everywhere. AP was covering it and, and papers everywhere were picking up the AP stories. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I'll look and see. I'll see if I can find some. Great. Uh, I think this is a great way to kind of end this, um, to wrap it up. And again, we want to thank you to the audience. Thank you to everyone at home. Um, again, Lonnie's Facebook page is search for Molly Zelko. I believe you could follow the museum, the spectator podcast.com. Um, but Amy Zelko, I presume relative AMI. Hello, Amy. And, you know, thank you for being with us and allowing us, you know, you, you share Molly with so many people in, in many ways. And um, I think all of us here, it's important that the family get the closure is saying, if we win the lotto, we will dig it up. Trust me, we would love to dig it up. So um, I, I think that I know, and, and something I always, the cool, th it's not cool that she disappeared, but I mean, um, Molly, there is no gravestone. And I think that just kind of represents, you know, it's, it's, I always saw it as kind of a little middle finger, you know, from the family to whoever did this to say that, you know, we are going to keep the vigil. We're not going to stop till we do get some closure and some answers. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that that is, again, why we're still talking about this and why we're here. So, 
Um, you know, I know we'll, you know, we'll keep searching. I think that's how we end the podcast with, we just say, you know, we are going to keep searching. So, and the search is important. So, um, again, thank you everyone. We're going to say good night now. It's right at eight o'clock here. So we've been on two hours. Feels like a few minutes, right? I know we, uh, so, um, you know, again, a big thank you to the Joliet Public Library, uh, Wormer Rogers, Duran Razan. Um, appreciate the support of the museum in this really critical time. Appreciate you all being with us tonight. Um, reach out to us. I think we've given you a lot of ways to, to kind of talk to us. So you can keep talking. Um, follow the museum on social media. Again, we have more programs ahead for you that we're excited about. They're going to cover a wide range of topics. So um, stay with us. But for now, again, coming to you live um, in Joliet's beautiful downtown from our low, lower level auditorium at the museum. Good nights.